the aggregate net effect of this proposal today would be a $400 million tax cut for Mississippians to be implemented over the next 10 years. I think that an election year Valentine to voters is, uh, it may taste sweet for a few, but it doesn't mean as much to Mississippi's economic future. The Lieutenant Governor unveils a $400 million tax cut plan. Is it a good idea or just election year smoke and mirrors? At Issue starts right now. Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the critical issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. And we want you to share your opinions and comments with us. Just go to facebook.com slash mpbonlinenews. On Twitter, our handle is at issue mpb. Also visit our webpage, mpbonline.org. Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves is proposing a $400 million state tax cut for individuals and businesses. He's calling it a pay raise for taxpayers. The plan calls for eliminating the 3% tax bracket on individual income, reducing the tax burden on small businesses, and removing the franchise tax on business property and capital. Reeves says the state's economy and revenue are growing, and this plan is about progress. Uh, if you are a conservative, and you believe that anything that makes our tax code simpler helps us make progress. Anything that makes it fairer helps us make progress. Anything that makes, us, makes our tax code flatter helps us make progress. And anything that helps encourage capital investment in our state and promotes long-term economic growth is progress. This would mean more economic growth for Mississippi. Uh, it would mean more money in the pockets of hardworking taxpayers. It would mean more disposable income for employers to do uh, a number of things, such as hire new employees, uh, give current employees raises, and reinvest money back into their business to expand and invest in Mississippi. Critics of the lieutenant governor's plan say not so fast. We spoke with Patsy Brumfield with Better Schools, Better Jobs and Corey Wiggins, director of the Mississippi Economic Policy Center, for their thoughts on the tax cut plan. Based on what we've seen, uh, particularly when you look at our education funding here in the state, when we look at our health care, look at our health care uh, statistics across the state, we know we need good education, we need good schools. We know we need good health care, and people need health care. And so those are the things on our approach and the things we need to be talking about instead of talking about corporate tax cuts. I think that an election year Valentine to voters is, uh, it may taste sweet for a few, but it doesn't mean as much to Mississippi's economic future as adequately educating our children. Uh, I think Tate Reeves is quick fix to a few of his friends and uh, very small amount uh, for Mississippi taxpayers in general is not enough to make up for the lack of investment in good schools and good jobs for our children. If Reeves plan passes and is signed by the governor, cutting these taxes could save businesses $220 million over the next 10 years. Taxes on Mississippi families would drop by about $150 each year. Here's what some of you had to say about the plan on social media. Scott Malk says what he needs to do is use the money for schools and roads. If he wants to help the people of Mississippi, he should cut taxes on food at the grocery store and other staples that people need. And Monica Mingo writes, taxes aren't the problem for individuals. Inflation happens and we expect to pay more for things. If our incomes never increase, however, how does that math even make sense? Increase the minimum wage, make big business pay their fair share of taxes. Simple stuff which can boost the economy and savings of everyday Americans. Well, state contract reform is gaining momentum. This week, the House overwhelmingly passed a bill that would establish a contract review board with members appointed by the governor and lieutenant governor. This reform comes in response to the no-bid contract corruption scandal at the Mississippi Department of Corrections last year. That, of course, resulted in federal indictments against former corrections commissioner Commissioner Chris Epps and businessman, former business or, and former legislator, that is, Cecil McCrory. The Senate also approved two measures on government contracts this week. Well, the House voted to approve a measure that would postpone the third grade reading gate for one year. 
The reading gate is a measure passed by the legislature last year that holds back third graders if they can't read at a set level of proficiency. We spoke with House, House Education Committee Chairman John Moore about it. The reading gate bill is, is a, probably the single greatest reform that we've done and it's just requiring the school districts to do their job. They're, they, are, they are bound by their, by their positions to teach our children. Well, if they are not teaching them to read in the, in the first four years of school, kindergarten, well, basically first, second, and third grade, if they're not teaching them to read by the third grade, then they, they need to look at how they're doing business. My question is, why haven't you been teaching them all these years? Why are we in this situation now where we have such a huge number of children that cannot read uh, in, in the uh, fourth through sixth and the seventh and eighth and ninth grade and on into high school that have difficulty reading and comprehending what they're reading. Well, enough is enough. And, you know, and I think the taxpayers of Mississippi want their children to be receiving what they're paying for, and that's, a, that's an education. The reading gate was actually passed in 2013, and according to the Clarion Ledger, Governor Bryant, who supports the reading gate, was disappointed with this latest decision. Assistant teachers in Mississippi classrooms could be getting a pay raise. The House passed a proposal to increase their base pay to fifteen thousand, or to, yes, to fifteen thousand dollars. Democratic Representative Cecil Brown introduced the bill. He tells at issues Paul Boger it could attract and retain more assistant teachers. These are people that work in our classrooms. These are people that are trained to be in the classroom with teachers, working with our kids and grandkids all the time. They need to be paid uh, adequately, and we need to be able to attract people into attract people into that profession. Now, the original bill only raised the uh, the pay to one thousand dollars. Why was it so important to raise that again? Well, I just don't think it was enough. To, first of all, no, it was not enough to reward the people, from, the hardworking people we're talking about. But in addition to that, it's hard to get people into that profession because the pay is so low. It's one of those things where you're in competition. I mean, you can go to a lot of fast food places and you can make more money than that. So we're trying to attract qualified people into the profession to make sure they're adequately paid. School districts currently supplement assistant teacher pay. Assistants were not included in the teacher pay raise that was that passed last year. Well, lawmakers are taking a second pass at banning texting and driving. The Senate is now considering a bill approved by the House that calls for a ban on texting and using social media on a cell phone while behind the wheel. The proposal does not prohibit making a phone call while driving. If it's made law, violators would face a fine of $25. The fine goes up to $100 in the second year. Similar legislation died during the session last year. Vehicle inspection stickers in Mississippi could soon be a thing of the past. The Senate passed a bill this week that would eliminate the required $5 safety inspection sticker. Senator Giles Ward sponsored the bill. He tells Ad Issues Jeffrey Hess the stickers are simply not necessary. And so you are fighting pretty strongly to get rid of these. Tell me why. Well, I've introduced this bill uh, for a couple of years. Uh, constituents back home, uh, and this is not in the bill, but they've said, goodness, we're not worried about the $5. It's the inconvenience. I've got a poultry farmer with 15 vehicles that have to be inspected. He tells me that if he took them to the, uh, to the inspection station, and we have a limited number in, of stations in his area, that it would take him at least a day and a half. He now has an arrangement with someone to come out and inspect them on site. All they're doing is filling out the driver's license, scraping the old one off, and putting the new one on. It's not accomplishing safety. It is not doing what it's intended to do and hasn't for many, many years. That's all we were trying to do here. Vehicle inspections currently follow a basic safety checklist. There is no emissions testing. Well, each week during the legislative session, we debate and exchange ideas with representatives from the Republicans and the Democrats. We call it the At Issue Roundtable. Austin Barber is a Republican. He was a senior advisor for the Senator Thad Cochran campaign. He's the founding partner of Clearwater Group and a graduate of Ole Miss. Brandon Jones is a Democrat serving four years in the Mississippi House of Representatives from 2008 to 2012. He's currently the executive director of a political action committee called the Mississippi Democratic Trust. He's an attorney at the Beria Williams Law Firm and has degrees from Mississippi College, Wake Forest University, and Mercer University. And gentlemen, we welcome you back to Thanks for having us. At issue. Let's start uh, with what we led the program with, the tax plan. Brandon, do you think this is just a, uh, an election year promise on the part of the lieutenant governor? 
I do think it's election year fluff. I'm a little bit skeptical of a plan like this during an election year when we're still not fully funding education, when we've got roads and bridges in disrepair. So yeah, I think it's a little bit disingenuous. Austin, is there more substance to it than that? Oh, this is great. I mean, I'm glad we get to have this. This is a big topic. We're talking about uh, taxes. What do we want to do? There's a choice here. Voters are going to have a choice. Last, last week, we talked about uh, Tim Johnson, who's going to run for lieutenant governor as a Democrat. Let's look at his record in terms of, let's look at the record of what Tate Reeves wants to do. You know, Brandon's supporting Tim Johnson, and that, that, that's good. Well, his candidate, when he was a supervisor in Madison County, tried to bring forth the largest tax increase in the history of Madison County, unsuccessfully. Now, here we have Tate Reeves who is a lieutenant governor, who is a Republican, who is working very diligently to pass a tax decrease. So voters, you're going to have a choice. You can be for less taxes or more taxes. And I think I, think I know where the voters will be uh, in November on but this, Brandon. Just a quick fact check. Madison County residents pay some of the lowest taxes in the entire state. As a matter of fact, there's only one county that pays more. And I'm a Madison County resident. I don't see a whole lot of complaining about the job that that Board of Supervisors has done over well, the that, years. Well, you are true. They do pay some of the lower taxes. But if your candidate for lieutenant governor would have had his way, those taxes would have gone up, my friend. But fortunately, uh, the rest of the board were against it and then you even had the city of Madison uh, themselves their uh, board of aldermen who passed a referendum saying this is a bad idea uh, you know sort of a public rebuking uh, of the Democrat candidate for lieutenant governor so this is a good issue voters want to hear about uh, how they're spending their money and I think what you'll see is voters who will say listen uh, Brandon and Wilson we want to see less taxes versus more taxes spend money on education which lieutenant governor's doing 110 million more dollars this year for K through 12 than last year more the most money they've ever spent on K through 12 the lieutenant governor's handling priorities for education but giving the taxpayers a break as well it's a good thing you know I, I know we got other issues to cover but I would just say I mean it's a very modest tax it's a very modest tax decrease and and we still aren't living up to our statutory obligations and so look you're never going to have a lot of gnashing of teeth when you say net tax cut but let's be honest about the overall economic impact that it has and right now we're not doing our job by our students all right let's move on to uh, an issue related to education and that's this third grade reading gate we heard a lot about of it uh, a lot about it last year uh, and essentially it would establish this standard that once you have com once a child has completed the third grade if he or she does not meet the minimum requirements for uh, reading proficiency they get held back and some there was some action uh, in, in the capital that, that that changed that a little bit and is going to delay it a little bit uh, Austin how do you feel about it? well I, I think and I know Brandon and I will agree with this we need to set high standards for our children they need to be able to uh, whether they're going from the first to second grade or the 11th to 12th grade and then you know then obviously graduating they need to be out uh, with a good education and be able to compete. Obviously, some of our schools do a better job than others. But here we have this very simple thing. Uh, Republican leadership, I think it was Representative Martinson, had brought a bill up. She was trying to fund more money to send um, reading teachers and so forth into the, into the uh, classrooms around the state to help these kids be able to learn how to read from third to fourth grade. A Democrat House member um, brought up an amendment that said, you know what, let's give that a one-year moratorium. Let's waive the requirement that would keep a kid from not being able to advance from third to fourth grade if they cannot read. I think that is ridiculous. I think we've got to do whatever we can to make sure our children know how to read and when they're going from third to fourth grade. So I'm very baffled at how this amendment ever uh, passed the House floor and I'm certain the Senate will take care of it, but I'm curious what's the, what Brandon yeah, What's says. the rationale behind it? Well, it, it's, it's good that we get to have these talks then because the truth is there's 6,000 students probably that stand not to go forward and so there's going to be a huge bottleneck if it were to be implemented this year. The other thing is this, this bill was patterned on a Florida plan. Whenever Florida passed this bill, they put $1 billion towards it and then they created 1,000 reading assistants. Mississippi has done maybe 75 reading assistants admitted during debate that they are not covering every school district and essentially admitted that this is an unfunded mandate. And so, sure, we all want to encourage higher standards. We all want to encourage our students to read, but our school districts are calling uncle because they know they can't fund this and they know they can't provide the teachers to implement it. So if you think there was enough money and enough teachers and personnel and expertise to get it done, do you think the Democrats would support it? Unquestionably, but it's, it's an unfunded mandate. And we should point out that this amendment that was offered in the House had bipartisan support. Uh, 
15 or so Republicans <laughs> supported it, a good third oh. of the membership almost. And so, you know, it was it was a bipartisan bill. My friend has a little fuzzy math over there on how many Republicans support it, but he does say it's an unfunded mandate. And then when Representative Martin and, and the Republican leadership in the House tried to fix that this year, putting more money in for these reading coaches, it was hijacked by uh, others in the House who said, you know what, let's give it a one-year moratorium. Those 6,000 kids that you talk about, let's just pass it from third to fourth grade whether they can read or not. Not fair to those kids, not, care, not, not fair to their families or these school districts. That's, that's just my opinion on this issue. All right, let's move on and talk uh, more politics here. Uh, we, we'll have a little bit more about uh, Representative Nunnally a little bit later. But next step in, in replacing uh, him in Washington is for the governor to set a special election, and then we will be electing a new representative to the U.S. Uh, Congress. Obviously, the Republicans will like to hold on to that seat. This will be a nonpartisan election whenever it, it, it does happen. Um, Austin, who do the, re the Republicans have lined up to, to take on, to at least run for that position? Yes, yeah, interesting. Just like we had in 2008, um, when Trent Lott stepped down, we had a nonpartisan election, uh, Roger Wicker's race, which I ran versus Trent, uh, excuse me, Trent Lott versus Ronnie Musgrove, and neither one had to run as an R versus D. We'll have the same situation here. Not sure when the governor will call it. Some in Northeast Mississippi in that district want him to hurry up and call it now versus waiting until the, the August primaries. I think from the Republican side, sort of the top candidates that I I hear who were seriously considering it. Mike Taggart, who is the Northern uh, MDOT commissioner, would be a strong candidate. Jimmy Maxwell from Oxford, who uh, has, you know, is a member of the Court of Appeals, uh, very well liked up there. Uh, of course, you can have the DeSoto County angle, uh, Senator David Parker. Uh, of course, you got State Senator Gray Tollison from Oxford who would run. And then we have to, you know, see certainly the Nunley family. We're all still praying and thinking about them. Uh, Congressman sure. is such a wonderful man. Uh, what does his wife decide to do? She's got a, a lot of things that she's, I'm sure, having to deal with, but I'm sure this is going through her mind as well. Brandon, what about Democrats? Yeah, it, it, Austin brings up a good point. This is a fast pivot into this discussion on, on the heels of, his, of passing, so we certainly still extend our thoughts and prayers to them. But Democrats have a lot of strong possibilities in the Northern District. Brandon Presley would win the race. He's the Public Service Commissioner. Republicans don't have an answer for him, him in the Northern District. Uh, Jason Shelton, Mayor of Tupelo, could win. Um, I think we have some strong representatives that should consider it, people like Nick Bain, Jody Steverson, and others. And so I think there are several folks up there who should be thinking about this and hopefully will. Yeah, it'll be an exciting race to watch. It, we, everybody's just going to watch and see what the governor says about when he will call the special election. It'll be um, a fast campaign no matter, given the time constraints. Oh, yeah, you can have a 60, 90-day turnaround, real fast race, and then, of course, you'll be running for re-election in 2016 in November. So yeah. we'll see. Let's move to something else that happened. Uh, um, Brandon, tell us about this, uh, th this, this bill before the legislature that was passed by the legisl legislature initially relating to uh, trading with or, or doing business with businesses that operate in Iran. Yeah, this is a kind of weird thing that happens when you let these nameless, faceless national groups write your public policy. ALEC is a group that's been writing Mississippi laws for a long time. And since it is an election year, they sent us down this wonderful piece of legislation that was called the Iran Divestment Act. And what that would require is Mississippi not to do business with anyone doing business with Iran. Which on the surface It has a certain sense. ring to it. It has a certain election year appeal to it. But the problem with not researching bills is that you might find out that a company that you do a lot of business with, like Toyota, has an Iran footprint. And so we saw a lot of debate, we saw a lot of consternation, a lot of bluster, and then we heard that slow beeping sound of the truck back <laughs> being, backing up as the next day the bill died. And, and in fact, it's not going to become law, correct? Uh, well, it's either not going to become law or we're going to have some pretty gaping holes that kind of carve out exemptions to the law. Well, you know, it was fantastic to see that Toyota, I think, rolled off the 500,000th uh, version of the Toyota Corolla up there in yeah. Blue Springs. So that's great to see. And, you know, we got to make sure that we're doing what we can do to protect uh, these, these big companies like that who've made investments and have thousands of employees in Mississippi. And I, I know our lawmakers will do what they can to protect those jobs and that investment they put in Mississippi. Austin and Brandon, thank you both. Thank we'll you. We'll see you next week. We Absolutely. appreciate it. Well, several pieces of proposed legislation died this week. Among them, the Tim Tebow bill. It would have allowed homeschooled students to play public school sports. It was based on a similar measure in Florida that permitted the football star who was homeschooled to play on a public high school team. There are about 15,000 students who were homeschooled in Mississippi. More than two dozen states allow private or homeschooled students 
to participate in extracurricular activities at public schools. The bill that would have lowered the required age for kids entering kindergarten from six to five also died. The goal was to get children in school earlier so they could read by the third grade. Well, that bill didn't make it out of committee. There were attempts to add it on as an amendment, but it's highly unlikely that bill will make it this session. And a bill that would have given parents the right not to immunize their children based on personal beliefs is also dead. Despite some support, the timing of the measles outbreak in other states apparently convinced lawmakers to stay the course. The bill was not brought up for a vote. Only two states, Mississippi and West Virginia, do not allow parents to opt out of vaccinations for their kids because of religious or personal beliefs. And the popular show Southern Remedy, well, it recently aired a special on childhood immunizations right here on MPB TV. If you'd like to see it, just go to mpbonline.org slash immunizations. <clears throat> well, as we mentioned earlier, Congressman Alan Nunnally was laid to rest this week. Family and friends gathered in Tupelo to pay their final respects on Monday. Nunnally died at his home on February 6th. He'd had brain surgery in June of last year to remove a cancerous tumor and was going through rehabilitation. Governor Phil Bryant talked about his longtime friend. I will certainly miss his friendship. Now that's a selfish way of looking at it. But the opportunities I have to call and talk to him and to hear that encouragement again, to hear the faith that he had in this great country, how much he loved this wonderful state and those beautiful grandchildren. Well, I, I will paraphrase the governor, just certainly one of the finest men I've ever known. I was privileged to serve as a pallbearer at uh, Congressman Nunley's funeral uh, on Monday. Um, I posted on one of the social media sites that my wife and I have kind of felt like we've lost a family member. Alan had an unusual effect on people. He just embraced you. He was bigger than life. He loved life. He loved the process of legislating both here at the state level as well at, at, at Congress. He will be so missed. He was just a tremendous asset for the state of Mississippi. Nunnally served as a state senator from 1995 to 2011 before moving to Washington to represent the state's first congressional district. He was 56 years old. Well, last week we told you about former Senator Tim Johnson switching parties from Republican to Democrat and his run for lieutenant governor. Here's what some of you had to say about that on social media. Franklin Griffin writes, very dumb to switch to Democrat is to give up on America and be supportive of socialist communist values. And Ed White says, Obama drove several Dems away, turned his base against him on some issues. On that note, we're joined by MPB's Jeffrey Hess to talk about some of what he's hearing from lawmakers this week. Jeffrey, good to have you with us, Thank as always. Thank you very much. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about this Iran thing that, that Brandon was telling us about. That, that was, uh, a, it was interesting, to say the least. It is interesting, and this happens a couple times every session. You just never know when it's going to happen. A lot of the bills get brought up for people to score political points. And then when you really dig into the facts, it fizzles away. This happened unexpectedly quickly. I mean, the, the fight over this was yesterday. And then come 10 a.m. this morning, it had passed its bill deadline and was gone. And I, I, you, uh, you put special things in there like a motion to reconsider and there's ways to, to, to bring them back and, and make them go away. Yes. Well, let's uh, move on to special ed vouchers. That's something else that's uh, Yeah, got forward. a lot of attention last year. Going to get a lot of attention then this year. Uh, a lot of people think this is going to be better. The Senate version came out. It's $7,000 for parents with children with special needs. They've added a lot of accountability standards to it that might woo some reluctant House members, but it's without a doubt going to be another hot topic going forward, probably through the end of the session. Because if it passes, they would be able to use those vouchers, that money, to go to uh, either to private school or private any school, institution. You could even go to private, a certified private school out of state. That's if they don't think the public school the child is going to is adequately um, attending to their needs. So let's talk about Common Core, something we haven't mentioned in the whole uh, program just yeah, yet. Yeah, big fight earlier this week in the Senate over Common Core. Um, the, the proposals that are coming forward to kind of mollify the critics of Common Core aren't really having the effect that I think some people were hoping they were going to have and take this issue off the table. The really hard com anti Common Core people, which are coming out of largely out of the Tea Party, they're not fooled by attempts to rename it and just call it something else and keep the standards in place, and they're not happy. 
Let's talk about execution secrecy. We, we uh, whenever uh, uh, um, someone is moved from death row to the uh, execution chamber there at Parchman, there are people who observe, but there's an effort to make it a little more uh, secret, I guess? Yeah, this is uh, kind of flying under the radar. There's, um, this would prevent the public release of the people who make the drugs, that kill the inmates, the people who administer the drugs that execute the inmate, and anyone who witnesses the, the execution itself. What's interesting about this bill is apparently it would allow anyone who's revealed to be any part of that chain of progress to sue for civil liability the person who revealed it. So if so, I reported from, as I've witnessed three executions in the state myself, if I reported that someone in the chamber said something and revealed them, there's a potential that they could sue me for making that information public. What's behind this? Uh, a lot of it's behind the recent botched executions in other states. Mm -hmm. um, they, a couple of executions, Ohio, I know one for sure, they lasted hours and it was not pretty. And when it comes out who's selling these drugs to the state, the people who are anti-death penalty then put a lot of pressure on these companies. We um, got less than a minute. Tell us about the uh, Hospital Sunshine Act and its status. Right. This comes out of the uh, Singing River uh, pension scandal where they secretly stopped funding their pension and then late last year said we might not have a pension anymore because we haven't paid it. It would require public hospitals to come under open meeting laws, which uh, would make them more open to the public, but at the same time could put them at a competitive disadvantage versus private hospitals. Uh, and finally, uh, this is really finally, Jeffrey Hest, our, our go-to guy at the Capitol who knows everything that's going on at the Capitol. This is your last program with us. This What's happening? This will be my last program. My wife and I, well, I've accepted a position at uh, Valley Public Radio in Fresno, California. My wife and I are going to be moving uh, later next week. It's an exciting opportunity. I'm happy to have been on that issue as long as I have been. Well, thank you. Good for you and, and so long from us. Thank you. We'll see you next week.